So I'm delighted to introduce Gerald Freed. Jerry is, as you can see, the Archibald uh, Professor and Chair of the Department of Surgery at McGill University's Faculty of Medicine. He's also the Surgeon in Chief of the McGill University Health Center. Jerry's particularly well equipped to talk about this specific issue, which is innovation and surgical care and the issue of the kinds of evidence one uses uh, to uh, make change or stimulate change in surgery. Dr. Freed's own interests are in minimally invasive surgery, was an early pioneer in that area and continues to develop it, but also realized early on <clears throat> that to both teach and promulgate, you need procedures, you need methodology, you need to blend pedagogy and surgery and empiricism to uh, not only teach surgeons and residents uh, how to use the, 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 the equipment and the ideas and the technology, but also how to measure outcomes. So uh, if you can't measure, it doesn't count, and I think that's one of the issues Jerry will tell us about. And finally, I think if you look back, and there are many in the room whose careers have spanned the dramatic change in surgery with the advent of technology methodology over the last half century has probably been quite dramatic if you think back to those who were residents 30 or 40 years ago and how they worked as surgeons and how young surgeons are working today. The pace of change has been dramatic. So I'm delighted to welcome Jerry and introduce him to you. Well, thank you very much. First of all, it's a pleasure to speak to this group, but something that I'm really passionate about, and that's uh, surgical innovation. And really what I'd like to do is take the perspective of uh, some of the changes that have really um, caused surgery to evolve and how those changes came to be and how surgery as an establishment, uh, what, what was the information or what really led to the changes? Because the irony is that there have been many things that have well been well proven in terms of evidence that have been very, very slow to actually be incorporated into practice, despite very good evidence, a translation of evidence into practice. Whereas other things with relatively little high-level evidence have um, been incorporated dramatically and uh, caused surgery to evolve. So I think it's quite an interesting phenomenon and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to, uh, to talk about it. I, I'd like to start with a talk about innovation uh, with this quote from Kennedy, who was a wonderful orator of course, but uh, for time in the world do not stand still, change is the law of life, and those who on look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. At the lunch break, uh, a few of us were talking about the TV show, The Nick. And uh, I don't know any of you watched it, but it was really, you know, I, I was enthralled by season one. I haven't watched season two yet. But it, it kind of re real, it makes you realize how far we've come uh, when you look at the evolution of surgical care over the, the previous century. And over, the la over my career, which now spans ab about 30 years, the evolution of surgery has really been dramatic after a period of time where it evolved relatively slowly. So the phenomenon of, uh, of that evolution, I think, is really worth uh, understanding. So I, I think it's interesting to kind of look um, at, you know, at the definition, but I think you know, in surgery, what we think of as, uh, as innovation is the creation of better or more effective products processes, technologies, procedures, et cetera, that are accepted you know, in the marketplace. Because there are lots of really interesting inventions that have not had traction. And I think the, the importance of an innovation is really that it leads to some substantive and positive change in, in the field. So I, you know, I, when I was planning the talk, I said, I wonder if there's a list. There's lists about everything. Is there a list of the top innovations, you know, uh, in surgery. I really couldn't find very much, but this is uh, from Forbes magazine, the top 30 innovations of all types of the last 30 years. And there are two uh, on that list that uh, are reflected in surgery. And one is a non-invasive uh, laparoscopy or robotic uh, or image guided surgery, which has been a thing that I've spent a lot of effort on. And, and the other is the introduction of stents, particularly for 
heart disease. So, uh, okay, that's one list. And I decided, well, I'm going to go and reflect on, on the, the things that really have evolved and had a huge impact on surgical care over my lifetime. And certainly open heart surgery, which was, you know, was thought that this is never going to be able to be done. Solid organ transplantation, and Harvey Sigmund was just telling me that uh, apparently it was only going to be possible in Englishmen or Frenchmen, but in North America, <laughs> it, was, it was an impossibility and people shouldn't pursue that. Um, total parenteral nutrition, the opportunity to keep someone alive with, uh, who couldn't eat and to bring someone actually from birth up until um, you know, maturity with uh, just intravenous nutrition has had a huge impact on our ability to do very big operations, uh, take care of surgical problems and injuries. Uh, where people would have uh, clearly died. Minimally invasive surgery, uh, joint replacement. In terms of quality of life, the impact that it's had, people aren't getting old anymore. People at 65, you know, used to be considered old. Now, you know, people at 80 are going to get their hips replaced so they could go back out and play tennis. The expectation and the impact on, on quality of life of joint replacement, I think, is important. Percutaneous angioplasty, that's really the opportunity that going through a needle puncture, not much bigger than putting in an intravenous, and being able to open up clogged blood vessels um, and hold them open with stents has been a huge impact, not only on the heart, but on other blood vessels throughout the body. So now people that are having abdominal aortic aneurysms, what used to be one of the biggest operations that we do, now have it done through a little uh, puncture in the groin and they're home the next day, or they're done as an outpatient. It's absolutely uh, mind-boggling. Um, use of stem cells and tissue engineering, I think we're just starting to see the the impact of that in the clinical arena, the artificial heart, and flexible fiber optic endoscopy that allows you to, to go through a natural orifice such as the mouth or the rectum or you know, various other orifices I won't mention, um, and be able to do surgery um, with no incision, no scar, and, um, you know, and have a huge impact. It used to be just for diagnosis, now we're able to do all kinds of uh, quite elaborate procedures through a flexible endoscope. So this is my list of, of innovations. So it's the, the amazing thing about these, that almost everything on the list, almost none of these surgical innovations were introduced into wide clinical practice based on data from randomized control trials, from high-level evidence. Whereas high-level evidence has, has certainly had an impact on various types of surgical care, probably um, management of breast cancer, uh, see Dr. Margulies here, one of the most important areas where randomized controlled trials properly done have had a huge impact on surgical care. Most of the innovations that have you know, been the most dramatic were really done uh, without the benefit of th these type of uh, high-level trials. And it's interesting if you look at some the other side of it. So, you know, inventions or innovations that, that uh, failed. Uh, gastric freezing for, um, for, for bleeding. Uh, it just, it, it didn't work. So, uh, you know, it wasn't, there was no randomized trial. It was just a series of observations. People thought it should. There was a certain logic to, to uh, cooling the lining of the stomach. But, you know, when they, uh, when they looked at a series of patients, it, it, it really didn't work. Um, extra corporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which is a procedure that has been used to get rid of kidney stones very effectively, was uh, introduced for the management of gallstone disease. And randomized controlled trials were actually set up to look at its role, and it disappeared because of the phenomenon of laparoscopic cholecystectomy without any randomized controlled trials. So it, it's, it, you know, it's quite interesting. Um, the angel chick prosthesis, which is a, a silicone collar that was placed around the lower part of the esophagus to prevent gastroesophageal reflux, heartburn, was widely touted in, when I, when I was a resident, I guess a, in the late 70s and early 80s. Randomized controlled trials showed this to be an effective treatment, but years later, or several months later, it started to erode into body cavities, into the heart, et cetera, and uh, they realized that this uh, is a dangerous um, device and it was taken off the market, despite the evidence that it, it physiologically behaved the way it was supposed to and, and was uh, thought to be very effective. And some of the endoscopic therapies now being done for gastroesophageal reflux disease are being adopted not because the evidence says that they're equivalent or superior to other treatments, um, but because patients 
are, are opting to go uh, for this treatment because they don't consider it to be much of an invasion. And if, even if it doesn't work, they say, well, it doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, it's not a big deal. And if it happens to work, th that's really good. But it's not truly, none of them on the market truly have been particularly um, effective. They're just not particularly dangerous. So it's quite interesting if you look at some of the successes in surgical innovations and some of the failures and realize that evidence has not played a very important role. So how do we decide about the uh, introduction of innovative treatments? And these are the questions that I ask because uh, on a very regular basis, members of the, uh, my department come to me and say, I would like to do this. We've got to start doing face transplants. We've got to start doing this. So and so you know, is, is doing such a procedure. So at some point, you have to come up with a process so that it, is, it seems to be fair and transparent. And so the first question, of course, is just on the face of it, is this innovation or this new procedure device likely to do more good than harm? But not only that, is it more likely to do good uh, than harm when it's widely propagated, when it's done in a more general way? Because you might find that a virtuoso person in a particularly um, supportive environment with the best technology and assistance may be able to do something but the idea that this can be propagated to truly have an impact on patient care in a widespread in the marketplace, so to speak, is something that, uh, that has to make sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, it's not likely that industry is going to invest in the technology and the devices in order to do it. It's, it's not going to last. The other thing, not, you know, besides good and harm, nowadays increasingly is value. So, you know, when we look at evidence, well, the first thing is we have to ask ourselves what we're going to measure. So I think value is a very important proposition now in the healthcare system where costs are, are, are very much under scrutiny. And so if this device may not be, or this new procedure may not be quite as effective as something else, uh, but it can be, it could be offered um, at a much lower cost and, and, and disseminated more widely, then perhaps that value of that device is something that needs to be taken into consideration when you make, make a decision. Another is how will you introduce it? Uh, there are many examples of new procedures or technologies that um, are associated with bad outcomes because the people that are using them are not adequately trained. And one of the things that I've been particularly in, in, uh, interested in is the learning curve and how, how we could avoid the patients paying the price at the time that we're introducing it. Because after you've done a couple of hundred, you're pretty good. But what about the first 200 patients that you're operating on or doing a new procedure on that, while well, you're not very good? So how do, how do we introduce it? And what is the cost of introduction? What is the time frame, et cetera? And that really leads to the final question, and that is, what are the metrics that we have to put in place to, to truly evaluate the new technology? Because we can do really good trials and come up with high-level evidence, but if we're not measuring the right things, or enough things, then at the end of the day, the, you know, the marketplace, when it's widely adopted, will dictate that that procedure, device, technology will stop. And we'd like to be able to think about it before uh, we get too far down the road, like the angel chick prosthesis. Beautiful randomized trials, interesting physiologic data, but in fact, a very bad uh, complication that was not considered when the uh, product was introduced. So there's always, when you talk about innovation, there's always a tension between people that tend to be conservative and people that tend to be progressive. And uh, I thought this was a nice quote, caution and fear are different things. When any good can be done, it ought to be attempted by any practical and justifiable means. But when no good is reasonably to be expected, there's no warrant for doing anything. And it sounds like an obvious statement, but I can give you some examples, and I will, of uh, people that have not necessarily complied with this very logical statement. And this was uh, something put forward by Percival Pott uh, many, many years ago. And so when we were interested in, in studying kind of the ethics of innovation, I went to speak to our ethics officer in our hospital, who was a lawyer and an ethicist. And uh, you know, his advice was very practical. And basically what he said is the smaller the increments that you're asking to make, the easier it is to ethically and legally introduce innovation. So, you know, if you're going from a regular optical system to a high definition system, or if you miniaturize your optical system, those are incremental things. They're not truly an innovation. And therefore, it, it's not a big deal to introduce them. The other thing is that if you have nothing to offer, 
then you have, uh, it, it's easy to offer. So if a person's gonna die, then you could justify perhaps experimenting with very little evidence. So the greater the potential benefits, um, easier it is to introduce uh, innovation. Desperate measures are easy to justify. Um, I, I think the, so then when a person comes up with an idea, the, uh, the first thing that I always ask is, okay, what are the potential benefits here? So theoretical benefits. Uh, you want to understand what is the scale of benefits. So I, I'll give an example. Um, there was a big rage a few years ago of, of, of single incision laparoscopic surgery. So instead of having three or four punctures uh, to do our surgery, the concept was, well, rather, rather than have four scars, let's just have one scar and do it in the belly button. It's going to be cosmetically really good. What's the potential benefit here of avoiding a few five millimeter skin incisions? In fact, this, there are you know, devices that were made for this, all kinds of complications occurred. And if you really think about it, there wasn't, you weren't going to reduce pain, you weren't going to reduce complications, you weren't going to reduce length of stay, it was going to be more expensive, and it was going to require a skill set that many people didn't have because the ergonomics of having all your instruments through one port were very difficult. And so I would have, and I did say, we're not going to get into this field because I couldn't conceive of any potential benefit, even a potential one. So the, the, f the first question I, I asked when that came forward is, well, what are you really trying to achieve here? What is your goal here? And what is the potential uh, gain or benefit of this particular uh, thing? Is it a safety benefit? No, in fact, the risk was going to be higher. Is it going to make your ultimate treatment, your cure rate of the disease, more, more effective? Uh, probably not. Um, is it more efficient? Does it provide more value? No, the technology is actually more expensive. Is it going to improve the quality of life or patient satisfaction? Well, the cosmetic benefit may be better because the scar is just one. So I, I think, you know, right away, if you ask these questions, I think you can dismiss some of the ideas that come forward because people always want to have something um, that they could attach to their name. It, it's a way, perhaps, of making a career and writing articles. But I, I think that, you know, the bottom line is there has to be some potential for benefit. I think also before you introduce it, you have to say, what is a theoretical or potential additional risk of the procedure? Uh, and that, you know, is, is there an increased risk of dying or, or risk of complication, et cetera? So one of the interesting things is the introduction of, of uh, hernia repairs by laparoscopy led to a complications, a risk of complications that didn't occur with the other technique. Uh, injury to major blood vessels inside the abdomen would be um, an example. Um, again, is this something that it, when, when distributed more widely into other hands might lead to a whole rash of complications because that the, uh, the, the kind of the second wave may not be at the same skill level as the early adopters? And how many cases is it going to take before someone starts to be able to provide that type of care at a at, um, success rate as effective as other alternative treatments? So what is the learning curve? Uh, th this is an interesting example of uh, the introduction of, of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in, um, in New York. And there were uh, a lot of people that were signing up for industry-run weekend courses where they would operate on one pig, get a certificate, they've completed this educational program, go back to their hospitals, get credentials on Monday and start doing these operations. And it gets back to the education side. But there was a whole rash of complications and deaths that were associated with it. It's really, although it's one of the great advances in surgery, it's one of the great embarrassments at the same time about the lack of professional uh, responsibility. And the, you know, uh, the health department in New York almost put a stop to laparoscopy. Interestingly, in Australia, there was a, um, I believe it was a cricket player that had a laparoscopic hernia operation and uh, had a very bad complication and ultimately had dead bowel and uh, his career was, uh, was over. And Australia did put a stop to this operation, made it illegal to do it and, and for a couple of years until it actually, uh, you know, a, a educational program was implemented. So, you know, when we have, we have an innovation, it may be a good one, the technology may be good, but if we don't train the people that are going to do it and it starts to get widely distributed because patients are going to demand it, industry is going to push it because they're going to sell stuff. The surgeons want to do it because it's a way of 
differentiating them from their peers, uh, there is really a, a risk here. And that's why it's, it becomes hard in surgery to measure the impact of an innovation if you don't take into consideration the quality of the operation. You're not comparing two pills that can be highly standardized. You're comparing an operation done in different hands, in different uh, settings, and with different amount of experience and training. So to measure the uh, benefits, it's really important to define uh, the endpoints and the metrics of what you're trying to uh, achieve in um, as thoughtful and all-encompassing way as you possibly can so that you can actually set up a database or a registry or a trial in order to really um, get the information that's going to have an impact on, uh, on your decision making. The, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. I, I like that. Also. <laughs> okay, so, oh, sorry. So I think it's really important to know your results. So I, you know, although I, I was uh, maybe a little facetious about the data, you must know your results. And I think it's also really important to try to understand uh, and set a certain number of cases before you're gonna look at the data. Because otherwise what happens, everything we do is associated with a certain risk of complications. And if you, if you just say you're, you're gonna go and you're gonna try this, in the first case you get a complication and that might occur in 5% of cases, you're dead in the water. So I, I think you have to set up a trial where you're going to say that we're going to do a certain number of uh, cases and then look at the data. Now if you have, uh, you know, you have repeated bad outcomes, then you may have to stop before that number. But I think it's really important to, to have that discussion before introducing it. And the IRB will generally uh, uh, orient us in that direction. And um, and, and then you set up a, you know, uh, a way of collecting your data, but you then establish periodic intervals for, for its review. Um, so what determines a successful innovation? I believe that it has to fulfill a real, real clinical need. It has to be financially responsible, particularly nowadays where value is an extraordinarily important issue when we look at, uh, at medical care. And it's got to have some reasonable ease of implementation, of scalability. Um, unless you're dealing with a very rare disease. But otherwise, we know that people will be strongly pressured to adopt it. And it, uh, if it's not, uh, if we don't think about how we're going to scale this up, then we're going to have uh, problems. So clinical need, and, and you know, these are different ways that you can uh, think of need. It, it can improve outcomes, so you can have a better success at cure, whatever problem you're trying to do. But another important outcome is the patient's acceptance of established therapy. And one of the interesting comparisons between angioplasty and stents for heart disease and coronary artery bypasses is patient acceptability. Because if you look at mortality uh, statistics and survival statistics, same thing, um, they're much better with uh, coronary artery bypass. But patients have, you know, they've elected to go the route that's uh, perhaps somewhat less effective but from their perspective is much more acceptable uh, to them. A third clinical need is to improve the efficiency of healthcare delivery. So if you can take care of more people uh, for an equivalent cost or at a lower cost, then that's an important uh, innovation. And the final thing, and one of the things that's really made a, a, an impact on a lot of things we do surgically is to improve the reliability of what we do surgically. So one of the uh, innovations that's come during my, my surgical lifetime has been surgical staplers. What surgical staples are, are uh, used for is to connect two pieces, you say, of bowel. Now, before that, we used sutures, and uh, you could sew uh, bowel together very effectively and efficiently and, and, and inexpensively. But there's a lot of variability in the skill of a surgeon sewing uh, two pieces of bowel together. So a real master surgeon, every stitch is properly placed in proper tightness, and they could compensate for the diseases of the tissue and, and really, I think, do an ideal anastomosis, better than a stapled one. But that the other end of the spectrum are people that really weren't as technically skilled and they had a lot of leaks. So what, what industry did was come up with a product that would basically uh, decrease the variability enormously, even though it added cost, and this uh, is really now pervasive in, in uh, surgical care. So value of innovation, um, 
you know, I, I think can be thought of from different perspectives. It could be purely financial. It could be the benefit harm ratio, so the ratio of good outcomes to, to negative outcomes. And the question we always ask people that come to me when they want to come up with a new technique or procedure, I said, if you have a given amount of uh, resources, what are you willing to give up in order to take on this? Is there something else that you're not going to be able to do? Because you can't always make the um, pot bigger and bigger. Um, I, I think, I, sorry. I, I, other ways of looking at, at finance is, uh, of course, there's a cost of the particular device. It's almost always more expensive than not using that device. But it might shorten the length of operation. It might shorten, shorten the duration of hospitalization, the period of time that person's off work, et cetera. It has to have enough beneficiaries to invest in the technology in order to, to be successful in the marketplace. And the person who's doing it, one of the big issues in the states now with innovations is that the physicians or the surgeons that are doing some of these new innovative procedures are not getting reimbursed for it because it's not has not been accepted by the uh, insurers um, and has not had a, uh, a code attached to it. So if the user is not getting reimbursed for it, even if the product has gone through a lot of evidence-based data, it's not going to be introduced widely because no one's going to do it for nothing. Now, well, you know, what I was asked to talk about is, well, what are the, the types of um, evidence and how do they then fit into this uh, innovation uh, process? So almost all real uh, innovation starts with a case report. The first successful human kidney transplantation or the first surviving uh, open heart operation, et cetera. And it really, it gets people's attention and it really is evidence that uh, of the possibility. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is something that has to be done, but it, 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 it actually starts to get people to think in the direction of this innovation. And that of innovation may be modified and evolve in some way, but it has, you know, although it's got a very low impact in, in journals to have case reports, most real uh, dramatic innovations have been introduced to the profession through a case report. The next step is to start to accrue evidence in a case series because at this point we're not even sure all the outcomes that we need to measure. So you, you tend to, uh, to do a, a series of cases and then often uh, there's a combination of perhaps some uh, prospective uh, data entry and some uh, retrospective analysis that might uncover things that you didn't think of putting into your, your data set. And it will start to allow you to frame your, your analysis uh, for, for further testing because it'll, it'll uh, perhaps open up unexpected things that need to be tracked. And that then leads to the development of registries. And ideally, a registry should be a prospective uh, accrual of, d of data on a large series of patients, hopefully as heterogeneous as possible because then you're starting to look at the, um, the real outcomes of a procedure when it's more widely disseminated. And so uh, I'll, I'll show a slide in a second, but probably the single paper that had the biggest impact on the introduction of laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the United States was a, an article written by a group called the Southern Surgeons Club. And it was basically a, a large case series uh, a registry uh, of data that was put together by a number of different surgeons in a number of different centers. And it started to give us an idea about what is the incidence of bile duct injuries, more rare events that we won't necessarily be able to know about if we're having a, uh, a more formal confined trial like a randomized control trial that's done with 30-day follow-ups, et cetera. Randomized control trials are important and obviously it's, it's probably the highest level evidence for comparative outcomes. The problem with randomized controlled trials is that they're highly structured. And we'll get to that in, in, a, uh, in a few minutes, but it is hard to standardize surgeons. So when you're comparing, when you're doing a, um, a comparative trial, and so if you were uh, testing me and I, in my, or my, my group, for instance, in the early, early days of laparoscopic inguinal hernia, and we did 100 inguinal hernias laparoscopically and 100 open, I suspect that our results uh, are, are gonna, were going to be better with the open approach because we were still learning and uh, we were going through our learning curve. 
and individuals within our own group uh, were learning at different rates. So there was a lot of variability in the quality of the procedure that we're doing. So now you know, most of these trials um, have to really be validated by people sending in videotapes and having a, uh, a group at arm's length look at the videotapes and saying that that person can do this operation you know, well enough that, it, that they can be included in the evaluation when you, when you conduct the trial. Um, but the problem is randomized controlled trials are expensive. Uh, they, they generally are highly selective in the uh, people that are included and those that are excluded. And they tend to have a, a finite period of time that you're going to follow people that might not reveal things like um, what we sh saw with the angel trick prosthesis erosion of the devices years later. So one of the problems. So case series, useful. Uh, I think uh, they often um, collate uh, outcomes of a single surgeon or a small group in a single institution. And it's a good starting point and helps you really start to understand what you need to measure. The registries, I think, are probably the types of evidence that have had the greatest impact on introduction of uh, innovations in surgery. And, and I think for a registry to be effective, it should be large, it should be diverse, and it should represent a uh, variety of uh, individual surgeons and institutions, uh, not just uh, the uh, McGill's and Hopkins of the world, <laughs> and Imperial College and places like that. Um, but the, the advantage is because they start to get large enough, you'll start to, to expose rare events that, that may be of devastating consequence, that but may occur infrequently, but are really important in the understanding of the place of this innovation. It also starts because it's be, you know, if it um, is a re representative of a, of a diverse group of investigators, it really allows you to look at the generalizability and the variability uh, of this procedure in different settings. So randomized control trials, I think, are, uh, provide high level evidence. I think they're very useful once the, 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 the procedure has established some level of maturity and the people doing it have um, kind of stabilized on their learning curve. So the timing of, of doing these trials is always an issue uh, of question. If you do it too late, no one cares anymore because it's already, you know, it's already established as, as a procedure. It's hard to take it back. If you do it too early, then your, your data is, um, is really biased by, you know, by the um, skill of the person at that procedure. So we don't know whether we're actually evaluating the surgeon um, or the procedure. Um, it, it's, it's very hard to standardize an operation because uh, uh, different surgeons might do the, uh, the same operation different ways or in different sequence or with different <laughs> instrumentation. If you try to standardize it too much, you actually may impair the ability of the surgeon to do that operation as well as they, as well as they can. So it, it's a little bit um, uh, difficult to, to know what the role is of RCTs when we look at an innovative uh, procedure. So this is just a, uh, the article uh, from the Southern Surgeons Club and uh, 1,518 patients had a very big impact. It was widely quoted. Um, you, you know, it's, uh, if you look at the number of citations for, uh, for this article, it's, it's very, very high. And it really wasn't particularly well uh, set up in terms of scientific uh, you know, validity and not nearly like a randomized controlled trial was. And interestingly, this is a randomized, first randomized controlled trial of laparoscopic versus uh, open mini cholecystectomy. It was done by our group at McGill, interestingly, uh, published in The Lancet, no one cared about it. It was too late. <coughs> you know, lap coli, there was already thousands being done, and, um, you know, it, it, it just didn't move the needle at all. So uh, the next issue with, uh, with innovation is the ease of Im implementation, and that's what, uh, what I got to before, because um, we might find that a procedure in someone's hands may be really good, but w once you start to disseminate it, then you're start to, starting to see complications because it requires a skill level a lot of surgeons don't have. Um, so that then begs us to ask, well, what is it going to take then to educate or train that individual surgeon, uh, and how do we actually provide evidence that that surgeon has acquired the knowledge and skills to do the procedure safely? And it, you know, it's one thing to come to a CME program and to take a course and sit in the audience and sleep. But um, how do we know that, you know, that you're listening to what I'm saying? How do I know that someone who takes my weekend course has acquired anything? Has, you know, 
how we validate the curriculum and, uh, and evidence. And what we've done in laparoscopy is, is actually a first, that we've actually developed a, um, an educational program and a simulator-based ba test. It's now mandated for all graduating surgeons in the United States, called the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery, that at least ensures that people have developed the basic skills that have formed the foundation for performance of that operation. That has never been done before. And I, I think that it is, it, you know, it's one of the ways of moving the needle because uh, when we saw the very bad outcomes of the um, early introduction of lap coles, I remember back to my days um, with uh, Harvey and Jake Garzon and uh, Hinchy and what Marvin Wexler, and we would be in the animal lab here at the uh, LDI, and there were people that would come through and take our courses, and we would roll our eyes and say, oh my God, you know. <laughs> but we couldn't prevent ourselves from giving them a certificate that they had completed our course, because we had no way to evaluate them, but we, you know, it was pretty obvious to us that there's some people that were really good, and there's some people that, <laughs> God help us. So we had to develop some evidence uh, that, that we could actually prove that people were trainable and had achieved this. So we have to protect the patients, and I, I think that that's really, really important. So there's an educational responsibility, and that educational responsibility has to have some sort of uh, verification. So how do people develop the proficiency? I think you have to recognize that everyone is going to go through a learning curve. Even a virtuoso uh, is going to get better uh, with experience. And people learn at different rates. So we can't say doing five of these procedures is going to be fine. Uh, I think that uh, we, have to, we have to account for that va variability. And there are a lot of factors, uh, as listed here, that impact variability. So just the time or the numbers themselves, uh, with the traditional way that we've um, looked at surgical training, probably not adequate for, for this. And you have to, and many of this technology requires not only the surgeon, but the whole team to be trained. Simulation, I think, has a, got a real important role, and it, 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 it focuses on the learner and uh, takes the patient out of the equation so there's no risk to the patient. So if, if a learning curve is shaped like this, and, and we've studied this a lot, and this is kind of the average uh, curve that you'll see with a very, um, with phase of very steep early learning, and then a very kind of a, they start to come to an asymptote uh, up here where you're, st you're improving still, but at a very slow rate. And the question is rather than learning in the operating room and going through this very steep part of the learning curve where your performance is not very good, um, for a period of time. What we would like to do and what we've been able to show is that you could actually develop what we call a pre-trained surgeon where we bring them up to a certain skill level outside of the operating room and then that, that skill is translatable and, and avoids the pitfalls with the early part of the learning curve. And we've done a randomized control trial where we've taken a group of novices of poor skill and randomized half of them to simulation training to uh, proficiency. We, we set the bar um, you know, at a level that, that we correlated with good practice in the operating room. At the end of the, uh, and the other group trained in the operating room the traditional way. Um, at the end, we evaluated both groups, both in a simulator and in the operating room. And we found that uh, six hours of highly directed simulation-based training uh, on, uh, to a group of novices with about one-third of the time or two hours being uh, supervised and four hours being self-directed, that uh, group of individuals were, was able to improve their skill level to the equivalence of two years of clinical training. So uh, they went from the equivalent skill level of a first year resident to that of a third year resident with six hours of training. And so we, we've shown that you can actually transfer the training, you can verify that, and I think that this is something that we have to think about more and more as we introduce technology that's associated with a learning curve that puts patients at risk. It's one thing to say, okay, you could do the operation more quickly. That, you know, I think is acceptable, but not at a higher risk to the patient in terms of complications. Um, so I, these are the things that I've uh, talked about before. I think it's also really important to recognize that there's an important bias inherent with the introduction of a new procedure or technology. And, and we as surgeons that do this need to recognize the conflict of interest. Because there are things that drive us to do that, whether we want to accept it or not. It's, it's good for our ego to be able to do something nobody else can do. It's actually good for our practice. It attracts uh, more people to it. It's good for our academic advancement. Um, you're, you're feted by industry, et cetera. So I think we have to 
we have to recognize that and, uh, and, and try to hold ourselves uh, above that. Because I, I, I think there's one thing that I'm, I'm trying to say today is our priorities need to be um, the patient. Um, finally, I, I think the IRB plays a really important role. They are our friends here. We often think of the IRB as an obstacle to advancement of, of the field. But they provide us some way of looking at it that provides a, a good basis for the evaluation. And they will help us actually advocate for the appropriate resources in order to make sure that what we're doing is introduced uh, safely. They'll help make sure that the consent form is, is appropriate in disclosing to the patient you know, the appropriate things regarding this new procedure. And they'll help us um, really identify the outcomes that need to be tracked and how often and at what time period uh, they should be evaluated. The department chair has an important role. They have to deal with practical issues with individuals that are coming to them. They have to, they want to move forward. It's an academic responsibility to move the field forward, but there's a liability associated with that too. So I, I think that uh, it's, it's really an important role. And I, I think every, every department chair should at least think about this and have some process in mind for how they're going to deal with uh, people that want to uh, innovate in surgery. Uh, then there, there has to be an appropriate uh, credentialing process, and uh, I spoke about that uh, earlier. Um, so you have to understand the technology you're using, otherwise um, you, you, you might have problems. Uh, so to kind of put this all together, I think uh, it's important for us to lead change. It's one of our academic responsibilities. And uh, if we're going to do that, we want, we want to make sure that the effort we're going to expand is justifiable, because there are benefits that are real tangible and um, not things like single incision surgery that really had no potential uh, for benefit. Um, then we have to identify what our goals are. What are we trying to achieve here? Uh, establish the appropriate measures that we, should, um, th that we should include in our evaluation. So as we start to attain evidence, we have to make sure that the evidence is appropriate. And understand what the risks are uh, versus uh, the benefits. Then start to accrue that evidence through a series of different types of trials that would be appropriate to the, the timing and the type of uh, procedure that we're introducing. Uh, understand that any innovation and any evaluation of innovation uh, cannot be thought of ex excluding the uh, importance of training uh, and that the, that the individual or, or institution has the appropriate resources to, to do this uh, safely. Uh, and ultimately to protect the patient. So. Um, I guess my conclusions are, are self-evident from um, what I, uh, I said. I'd just like to kind of uh, close by, by saying, uh, this is my, my mentor when I was doing my research fellowship. Uh, Jim Thompson said, and I think it's very thoughtful, without research, the surgery of today would be the surgery of yesterday, and the surgery of tomorrow would be the surgery of today. I thought it was something that I always uh, think about. He's guided me a great deal. Um, so I'm just going to say that I, I, one of the things that we're really excited about as, as a department is we've developed a graduate program in surgical innovation, a master's and PhD program. And what that's done is brought together clinicians with engineers, hardware and software engineers, and MBA students, and they form a team. Uh, we have 24 graduate students in it in our first year this year. And um, they spend the first few months uh, going around the hospital and identifying opportunities um, to innovate. So the, the ideas are generated by, by the students. Then they, they get a, period, a series of lectures on intellectual property, on um, uh, regulatory you know, compliance issues, business uh, skills, et cetera. They do an internship in industry or within Health Canada. And at the end, the, uh, they, they're uh, supposed to come up with an intellectual property, an invention, uh, a device, et cetera. So we're trying to actually develop a group of people to truly be innovators. And um, we've opened up a Center for Innovative Medicine at, at the Glen that we're really quite excited about with an experimental operating room, a simulation center, and an environment for engineers to be in situ, to be in the operating room environment themselves so that they can start to get stimulated by this. So I, I think it's, a, it's an exciting time. And I, I think the issues that uh, are being addressed in this symposium are really critical uh, as we start to move forward. So again, thank you for the privilege of speaking.